Welcome to Divorce TV. I'm your host, Wally Marcus. Our topic today is divorce and addiction. My very special guest is my good friend, Suzanne Lovejoy. And I'm um, looking forward to talking to you as soon as I finish a little bit of my, my spiel starting off. Uh, I always like to remind uh, our viewers that it, you can email us if you have information, if you have ideas, if you have questions, if you want to be a guest or you have suggestions for a guest. You know, please email us and we'll show that on the screen periodically, so you are at the end of the show, actually. And, and you can, we'd love to hear from you and get some feedback on what we're doing. So keep that in mind. Welcome, Suzanne, to your second appearance on... Uh, Divorce TV? Yes, it is. And you're nervous both times. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> well, that's that's natural to be, to be expected at this point. I know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm intimidating. What can I say? No, I don't um, think it's that. But. <laughs> but I, I always enjoy discussing divorce with you, either on the show or off the show, and I, I always learn something. Um, okay. Before we start on the conversation, I always want to remind uh, our, our viewers that this is not a substitute either for therapy or a substitute right. for legal advice, that you have to go out and do it. We try to inform the public, but that we're not really... Uh, giving you that situations and if you want to learn more about it, you can go back to the one we did on divorce and therapy a while ago they're all on YouTube and you can watch some more shows mm -hmm. for those of you that didn't see you the first time and don't know you can you tell us a little bit about yourself well sure um, I've uh, transplanted here from New Jersey about 26 and plus years ago wow. I know, followed my family out here um, not directly from New Jersey but I came th via Vermont which was very a very cold climate and spent a winter many winters out here in one winter probably around this time and we had a great winter out here it was the 80s I was wondering why am I still living in the frigid cold <laughs> so uh, relocated out to Arizona um, I have a uh, small private practice in outpatient psychotherapy I'm licensed as a marriage and family therapy in the state of Arizona and I've been in practice for over 20 years. You, 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 have to, you do something very special, which I you, you showed me, which you got to tell people about, which is your brain. Well, I've recently uh, begun training in uh, neurofeedback. Um, What's a good but, name? What's the name again? Brain. Uh, the software, I want to say the, brain drain, but it's not. No, the, so, the software program is called Brain Paint. Brain Paint. Right. Yeah. But I do have some specialties. I mean, in general, what I've been doing over the last 20 years, I have specialties. I do a lot of couples work. Um, uh, helping couples stay together, helping them decouple. I uh, also have a specialty in eating disorders. So that keeps me quite busy. Yes, it certainly does. Yeah. Uh, well, we need to do the show. Well, next time, if I can clock you back on, we'll do eating <laughs> disorders and divorce. But we're talking today about divorce and addiction, and I've been exposed to mm. that, you've been exposed to that. Right. But what is addiction? Well, addiction, don't we banter that name around a lot? I realize every, that. We did that, and then all of a sudden I'm trying to think, well, what, really, what is it? Right. Well, everything is considered an addiction nowadays. Um, but if we want to get kind of down to a, if we have a, a broad idea of what addiction is, it's a physical and psychological dependence on a psychoactive substance. you got to repeat that. Yeah. Physical and psychological dependence on a psychoactive substance with withdrawal symptoms and probably the hallmark of, of a true and the most narrow definition of addiction is that there are physiological withdrawal okay what about other addictions too i mean i mean we hear about sexual addiction we hear about gambling addiction we hear about right it's not substance based no it's not substance and so they're starting to differentiate and call those process addictions okay when it involves behavior if it's um sex, if it's gambling, if it's uh, even food, um, even though food is a substance. It's not a psychoactive substance. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about divorce, and are there any statistics at all that you're aware of that deal with uh, addiction as a cause of divorce? Well, it's hard to find something uh, specifically on a number, even though we all love to have numbers and statistics. Um, we're a little more heavier weighted on uh, finding predictors, um, but I did find one statistic, uh, and this is for alcohol, because there's a lot more research done on alcohol dependence and alcohol abuse in divorce. And so one study uh, came, said that they found that 11% of men and women who were getting divorced or divorced said that the cause or the reason uh, was alcohol influenced. 
you're, you do couples therapy too. So, I mean, you're seeing. I do a lot of couples, couples therapy. therapy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, it's interesting you say 11%. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. you know, usually it's, I hear communications, I hear money, I hear infidelity. Where would you sort of rank? And it's maybe anecdotal on your part, I know. Well, actually, there are some, there are some statistics on, uh, treatment difficulty, if that's what you're talking about. Um, I'm sorry, though, I was thinking more in terms of people getting divorced or coming in for couples therapy who have mm -hmm. the kind of a problem. And it seems to me that, as I said, the problems that you typically see are infidelity, money issues, although I think a lot of them are underlying communications difficulties. Right. I don't think mm -hmm. people in the legal profession think too much about addiction being that. It's not even one of the statutory basis for getting a divorce. Mm. I think alcohol might be, a, if you're drunk, I guess you could be, but not in terms of an addiction on that. Mm -hmm. Well, alcohol and addictions um, really have a very negative consequences on marriage and family. Um, so it's, it's often a cause, actually, we see kind of a bi-directional influence. There's a um, alcohol consumption or addictions can go up if there's marital distress and uh, so it goes up that way or marital distress goes up because of increased consumption. And so when they're presenting very often they're saying that they're fighting or they're doing other things but when you start looking behind it you see that they're fighting because of the alcohol. Oh. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're fighting. I do have, um, I do have cases. I have cases that uh, where once they stop drinking or one of them, if one's a heavy drinker, stops drinking, they can start talking and working things out. Um, that's not uncommon at all. So I have seen some good results when a person can stop drinking. Um, once, if they realize that drinking is influencing their communication, they fight more. You raised an interesting point there, and I, I tend to I know, jump around a little bit, which can be confusing, but you said if they realize and that, that's, mm -hmm. that sort of resonated with me because okay. it seems to me that more often than not, when I've seen cases, particularly with alcohol addictions or alcohol use, they almost inevitably, I don't think I've ever seen anybody say, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug abuser. They don't, you know, there's almost a total, I'm not sure it's real denial or just self-protection denial, but that's, it's a, it seems to me it's, it's a real problem because they, they never realize it. Well, they're either in recovery when I see them or they're coming in and, and there is an addiction or a substance abuse problem in the relationship or that's influencing the way the relationship is going. All right. And I have to ask the question. Yeah. And I guess it's, maybe it's easier. I guess the people have always said, yes, I drink, but I'm, I'm not an alcoholic. Or yes, I, I, I'll socially take drugs, but I'm not. Of course. That, that's part of the denial system. And that's where, you know, we have to kind of finesse around and figure out, okay, is this part of the problem? Is it making things worse? Is that why they're coming in? Um, so how do you deal with it? I mean, somebody is in a, in a denial situation and they're addicted. They deny it. Well, it, and, if and, I, and the question I guess for you always, mm -hmm. which I find it also myself, mm -hmm. is I don't know. I mean, is, is the other party saying, you know, is the other spouse saying they're addicted because, they, you know, they think they are, they're a problem, or well, are that, they really, are, you know. Right, so those are the issues, that, those are the issues on the table. I have a couple in my room, um, and, you know, one spouse is saying, you drink too much, I think there's a drinking problem, I think you might even be dependent upon it. Oh, no, um, I don't, here's a classic. You must have the same client I had. <laughs> yes. Here's a classic, no, I don't drink every day. So the definition of alcoholism or dependence is, I, I have to do it every day. I have to get drunk every day. So they have a very narrow definition. Um, you know, or I don't drink as much as so-and-so. Or like you said, uh, you know, they'll say, well, you just, you're just kind of paranoid because you had a father who drank a lot. And so, you know, if even I have a glass of wine or a beer, you think I'm over drinking. Um, so we've, I've got to wade through all of that. I sometimes have um, other family members come in, uh, maybe have the kids come in. Um, I have to ask, you know, are there any consequences or uh, damages? Are there legal problems? Is there job loss? Uh, you know, to kind of bring it forth. And little by little, if I am suspicious or there's enough evidence to suspect that there's a problem, 
Um, I will ask if they would stop drinking. Let's see what life is like. Can you do that for 30 days? And that's often a good test. So if they're able to go 30 days and we don't have a problem, then maybe it isn't that big a deal. Maybe it's more of an abuse it's problem. Good, it's a good approach. I didn't actually, you know, it's really, you think about mm -hmm. it, it's really obvious, yeah. but I don't think I've yeah. seen that done. Yeah, one of the key indicators that there really possibly is an addiction or a dependence on it is if I get grief about it. No, I don't need to, or, you know, why should I have to do that? You know, there's a lot of resistance to it. Well, how do you respond to that? Um, well, I, I share with them that if it isn't really a problem, you should be able to do this. <laughs> or, I mean, sometimes yeah. I've had that situation, and what I also mm -hmm. will say sometimes to people is, what do you got to lose? Right. You know, yeah. if there's no problem, it's fine. If there is right. a problem, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there are times I've had cases where I've um, had people sitting right in my office, and the spouse says, well, you just arrived late, and... Wow, your eyes are really glassy, <laughs> and I think you just used before you came in here. And the person sits in my office and is denying it and looks glassy-eyed, and this isn't the, necessarily the first session with this couple, so I have some rapport and alliance with them. And uh, I'll just pick up the phone sometimes, and one time I picked up the phone and got the coordinator or the head person of the outpatient treatment center I wanted to refer this person to and I said so and so can you have my patient come down yes got there the next day um, he didn't believe what the guy was saying and he said well then would you take a urine test right here on spot and so those are excellent resources the outpatient uh, treatment centers we have here for chemical dependency so he took a urine test and said I'm sorry, he came up dirty, and so he was busted, basically. <laughs> what about random right. testing? Random testing? Uh, that's more or less done, not usually with spouses, um, but with kids or adolescents. But if it was somebody was denying that they were using... I they have, to, they have to volunteer for yeah. that. I mean, I, I can't administer no, I that. Yeah, yeah. What are, and I think you've alluded to some of these, mm -hmm. but what are some of the roadblocks in the, that this sort of presents in uh, therapy or dealing with a couple, mm -hmm. the drinking or the... Uh... Well, I think, I think denial is one of the major, major roadblocks. Um, people are fighting about, you know, who said, you know, you are, I'm not, you are. So that, that's a big roadblock. But... Uh, what I find that they come in, you know, before it's even identified as a problem, um, what we're talking about are issues of, you know, um, availability. Is the person there, you know, I woke up this morning and you were, you had a hangover and you couldn't help out with the kids and you couldn't, you know, be there for the day to do anything. Um, and this happens on maybe a regular basis, or they're fighting over, uh, went to a party, and it was time to leave, and the person drinking didn't want to leave for hours and hours and hours. So either either the spouse is stuck there, said, I'm going home, and you take a cab, um, and there's a lot of fighting about, about that, or who's going to be the designated driver. Um, and they also fight about sex, you know? Um, intoxicated spouse wants to have sex and the spouse that's not intoxicated, you know, it's like, I don't want to have sex with you right now or, or it's a big failure because of impot impotency. So it complicates everything at that point. It is very complicated. You, you haven't yeah. mentioned domestic violence. How does domestic violence come into all this? Well, I, the rates are increased. Uh, domestic violence goes up. Um, you know, we've all heard of the happy drunk and the mean drunk. And so, you know, again, picture that, uh, you know, they come home from a party and intoxicated spouse wants to be sexual and the other spouse does not. And there's a force or demanding. And so they get into a fight and it could get physical. Um, you know, they just, it, it inhibits, you know, your inhibitions are lowered. So it makes a bad situation yeah. worse in yeah. more situations. Yeah, and all those anecdotal stories, I mean, they really, there are many of them that are, are actually happen where, you know, 
parent comes home drunk and is very demanding and this isn't picked up off the floor or go get me that or go do this and there's a lot of yelling um so you know these these are very real situations uh, we haven't talked much about children into this whole process um mm -hmm. i mean it's clearly it doesn't have a, a good doesn't help with children but right how do you, you if it deal with the children even in, telling the children that there's a problem or not telling the children there's a problem? Well, you have to always look at what the age is. Um, so really, really little, you're not going to talk to them much. But when you get into probably middle school, uh, high school certainly, they know what's going on. Um, they're all educated nowadays. And they're, you know, they, they see, they hear, parents think maybe they don't, but they do. Um, so I'll sometimes have the uh, kids come into the office and we'll have a family meeting about it. I've done that. Um, uh, I just say, well, sit down and let them know, because maybe at this point uh, they're ready to get into recovery. Maybe they're ready to go to 12-step uh, meetings. They're, maybe the spouse has been evaluated and they're going to go into a treatment center or something like that. And so then there are resources for them to involve the whole family. Uh, I was trying to think of what ends up happening with the kids when they uh, don't know. Don't know. But I guess you said they, they do know. They often do. I mean, it's hard not to for um, uh, many of them, especially when there's a discrepancy. The, the biggest problems are when there is a discrepancy in the consumption. It's not how much a person drinks. And we're, so I'm mostly focusing on well, alcohol. Okay, today. so yeah, I mean, I guess in your, yeah. this is a quick sort of aside at that point, mm -hmm. but if the, ki if the kids now recognize that there is a problem, mm -hmm. then what happens in terms of the family dynamics? Um, well, I have, I mean, I'm thinking of one, one family. Um, the son was very, very angry. Uh, this happened to be the person that was sitting in my office and said, um, sober, um, and I had sent down, <laughs> down the street to get evaluated and came back dirty. And um, his son was really very angry and uh, no respect for his father. And there was a, uh, you know, the other siblings were a little younger and they were a little more out of the loop. Um, but we had to work through quite a bit because the dad still expected to have parental authority over his son. And his son had no respect for him anymore and wouldn't listen to a thing he said. Um, so that was a challenge to kind of, they had to you know, talk it out and, you know, and help the father see that, you know, his son had a right to be angry and, and wouldn't respect him. Right you now. once got to sort of raise a, a different, uh, sort of a different question is that a couple is getting divorced and then there's always going to be an issue of parenting plan and who has sole joint custody. Right. And there's, let's say there's an addiction issue here in terms of alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. What's your, I mean, What's your sense on two on sole custody, joint custody, parenting planning, and certainly, I mean, I was covering a lot of questions here, but right. visitation, I mean, I mean, I've seen over the years where people are very concerned that, that the person will be high or have had alcohol and are driving the kids or, you know, taking the kids there and that somehow something's going to happen to the children. Right. These are very real concerns for many people. I think when you get to that stage, um, often it's, uh, it's good to have a custody evaluation where somebody objective is evaluating both parents. Um, it, you know, every, every case is different. Is, is the parent uh, in some kind of treatment and recovery? And of course, there's always a risk that, you know, they're going to uh, fall off the wagon when the kids are visiting, et cetera, or something. But, I mean, that shows in favor of a parent. But let's say it's kind of a nastier divorce um, I think that that's when, you know, there might be a battle over custody instead of sole custody going to the sower parent, there might still be a fight for joint custody. And I think that's when the custody evaluations come into play because they will make a recommendation to the court. Unfortunately, that's where it often will go. Although I, I was thinking sort of on a problem solving basis, the supervised visitation sometimes in a situation might work with Right, but I think that often has to come from the court. I mean, you might know more than I do about well, that. I, I, we've had situations where I mean, we're mediating cases where there are problems like that, and you know, it's, if it's a question of no visitation at all mm -hmm. versus 
Oh, of course. Supervised visitation, right. very often the person will opt for, at least on a transitional basis, for supervised right. visitation. Yeah. And for those of the people that don't know what supervised visitation is, the supervised visitation is uh, where you have some neutral person there, there are mm -hmm. people that out and do that, who are present during the, you know, the mediation, right. during the, the visitation, right. and so that the person is never alone with the children. Right. Well, I think, I, I think that we all strive to allow contact. It's simply a matter of, you know, is, is there a risk for, um, you know, being intoxicated while you're in the care of the kids, and if there is, then we don't want to we don't want to take contact away. So it would probably be supervised. You know, supervised. And there's some additional cost for that, but at least it's a it's transitional, and well, you can course. sort of see what happens right. in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think we sort of sort of tiptoed around this a little bit, but I, okay. I, it seems to me that, and, and it may happen more with me than it happens with you, is that couples come in and they don't reveal there's an issue of drinking. Of right. addiction or drugs, so, and I don't know, maybe that comes out to you when somebody comes to you for couples therapy and doesn't doesn't admit that there's a problem. They're that embarrassed all, by it. That happens all the time. And then you, I mean, eventually, yeah. what happens at that point? It comes out, or well, uh, I have a really fascinating young couple um, that I think were incredible. First of all, the, the the way they got to me was they had a fight, and they both the next day decided to call to get some help. And they didn't both call me, but they each called someone at the same time. That's how they originally got to me. And they came in and they were having lots of fight, you know, fights. They worked together and so um, they'd come home and they'd be fighting uh, about work issues. And it turned out that the, the husband was the wife's boss at work. So there were lots of issues around. They'd go home and she'd be complaining about this sort of thing. And so the work stuff came home. Um, she mentioned that she, she worked part-time and she mentioned that at home she would drink and from time to time, but I didn't, I didn't get how much she was drinking and how much that was influencing a lot of the fighting because she'd be home alone a lot and he'd come home and she'd need to talk about stuff and she was intoxicated. Um, so before I actually, you know, got to that place with them, they came back in one day and said, on the same exact day, he had been visiting her mom in California and went to California to talk to her mother about his wife's drinking. And so, you know, I think she's drinking too much or, you know, has a problem here. And unbeknownst to them, the same day, she said, I drink too much. I, I'm, I'm going to AA. <laughs> so they did the work for me. But ever since she's gotten into recovery, they have gotten along so well. I mean, the work that we do. Can in you figure therapy, out what was the trigger here? What call, why? Why that? I mean, what cosmically happened here? That why they both came uh, to the same conclusion. That same. part. That part I don't know. But all I I can tell you is that ever since she stopped drinking and she's done really really well, um, they know how to conflict resolve now and they get along and. Um, yeah, I just graduated then, actually. That's good. I, as you were saying that, it reminded me of a situation I had once where, or it, it happened more than once, where couples would come to us for mediation and we would do the financial analysis and it didn't make sense. I mean, the, the incomes were good, the expenses were low, but they were always short of money. And then I've now sort of raised that as a red flag that means that they're, you know, drinking or more often than not, it was cocaine or drugs that they were using. Cocaine there or was, gambling. There was, yeah, yeah. there were, e it was eating up all the extra right. cash and putting them over the edge, but they didn't admit it. Right. And so we sort right. of couldn't deal with it. And eventually right. they sort of had to come up and sort of, you know, yeah. say, you know, kept pushing them. This doesn't make sense. Where's the money going? And then you right. very often will finally right. get an admission. Well, where's, there's that denial system again, and it's not a problem, and it's whatever's going on is minimized. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing, isn't it, to think that somebody's in your office stoned, and they they look at you and say no. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a pretty it's, intense denial system, don't you think? Yep, as, as yeah. certainly. I guess the only thing that's worse than that probably is that the, the therapist, the attorney, is high, but uh, I haven't seen that happen ever. So, um, what about the role of AA and other groups in the twelve-step program and all this? They're they're critical for most people. I mean, there are a certain small percentage that won't go to OA, uh, AA, don't like twelve-step. They won't, you know, they figure their own route through it. 
but um, it has saved many lives. And um, when families get involved with AA and the 12th step, uh, they can pull their families back together. Uh, and, yeah. Have you noticed there work? You know, there's, it seems to be that, you know, um, you have some other issues sometimes where the kids are doing drugs, which I think puts stress on marriage. But also, what happens is one of the parties is dealing, dealing which adds a whole different dimension, just is, is not only doing drugs, but dealing drugs. Yeah, we have the Breaking Bad story yes. for that, right? <laughs> um, boy, that, that TV show <laughs> reveals a lot. You know, legal problems, I mean... Well, he wasn't, I think he was, that's right, he was dealing, he wasn't using it. But right. um, Breaking Bad. Yeah, but, dealing, so... Um, but that certainly, they ultimately got divorced, and I guess, and you're right, I hadn't thought about that, but in Breaking Bad, they ultimately get divorced, so they get back together. Right, they do. Yeah. On that one. Yeah. Well, you know, it's amazing. Some families stay intact. I mean, I, I know families that, um, you know, dealers have gone to jail, and they've come back out, and they stay, you know, they're back with their family again, and then they get busted again, and then they are put away. And so some families, no matter what, they seem to stick together. And other families don't. Uh, you and I discussed earlier on about the adversary divorces versus mediated divorces, and it made any any difference between the two, uh, which I guess you thought was a little bit more my field than uh, than your field. But uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether you can handle the addiction problem differently on that one, I mean, my sense on that really was is that it was easier to handle an immediate situation where you you know you could sit down and it's almost a therapeutic kind of quality to it where you're dealing. It's not really therapy, but you're able to have both people there and talk about it as opposed to an adversary situation where it really becomes a, another a weapon in the bag of weapons to club the other party with. Uh, well, I always think mediation is, you know, uh, the first step if, if the couple is able to uh, listen to each other and, and be mediated. Okay. Um, and this is a situation you think couples therapy or couples therapy are better or... Uh, Regular therapy, individual therapy. For dealing with this kind of problem. Uh, I we think, have very short, we got a quick, quick okay, answer, we got to wrap up. Okay, I, I think that individual therapy and uh, uh, treatment programs or 12 step is uh, critical for the, uh, the addict. And I think once, it, as they're in recovery, then to help the marriage, then couples therapy is... We're running, we're running out of time, Suzanne. And it's a pleasure as always. I appreciate you coming in and talking to me about uh, this issue, which I think is very, very critical. And I want to say you've been watching Divorce TV with Wally Marcus and Suzanne Lovejoy. We've been talking about divorce and addiction, and we hope you've enjoyed the show and have learned more about these problems. Thank you for watching. <laughs>